close like in the slot. It was a dream, but now, alhamdulillah, it's a reality. It's a reality. I was brought up in a Christian family, so we would go to church every Sunday. And from a very young age, like, I knew that Christianity was not what I believed in. And one of the first instances which I remember was I was actually in church and we had to write a song about God. And my song was Jesus and God, Jesus and God. This is my, it was like a little rap. And I remember the pastor came over to me, he grabbed the piece of paper and he scribbled it out and he said, no, Jesus is God. And it's from this moment, maybe I was about seven years old, when I realised that Christianity is not, it's not for me. So, I continued to go to church for many years, you know, because it was the closest thing that I believed in. I always believed in one God. And uh, from the age of about 14 years old, I began to work in like a, a social club. It was like a working men's type club, you know, for like a lot of the English people would go there. They play snooker and things like that. And I actually ended up starting to sing because uh, I wanted to get into singing. I became a jazz singer. So from, from the age of about 14 onwards, I was actually a professional jazz singer and I was still going to school. Now, my parents decided that they didn't want me to go to a local school because it was quite a, a white, uh, white area, you know, quite, there's a lot of racist people there as well. Plus the education wasn't that good in that area. So they sent me to the other side of Manchester, uh, to, to Hume. And in this school, it's quite a mixed school. You have people from different backgrounds, you know, a lot of Africans there, a lot of, you know, people from the Caribbean, Asian people, different people. So it was a mixed mixture of different nationalities and cultures and religions. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a good thing for me to go there. Now, from, from like the age of 18, uh, my area where I lived, there was a, all of a sudden there's a lot of Africans moved into the area. A lot of Africans from like Sierra Leone, mainly West Africa, like Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and it became quite a, an African area. And I, I came into contact with some friends from Sierra Leone, and we started to do business together. And um, all for quite a few years, we were doing business together, and eventually we, we ended up going to uh, West Africa. Now, around this time, I, I was singing, I was you know, doing my jazz, mu jazz music. I was also DJing in the clubs. I was DJing like hip hop and R&B, stuff like this. And my friends, they would do like nights in clubs and stuff like that and we'd be DJing. So this, I really wanted to get into the music industry. And at this point, like I was contacted by uh, Sway. You know, he's quite a well-known rapper in London. You know, he used to be quite big. And uh, I, did a, I did a track with him, you know, where we, we did a mixture of like jazz and hip hop. So I was actually, you know, I was getting about doing my music, things like that. And it was my dream to be like a jazz, you know, a big jazz singer. This is what I wanted to do. And, and actually, my, my career was actually doing well. You know, I was getting a lot of gigs. I was singing on cruise ships and singing in different football stadiums and venues. And it was becoming quite good. And this is really what I wanted to do. You know, I was just concentrating on doing this dream. So at the age of 18, uh, a lot of... Uh, Africans moved into my area, you know, it became quite an African area. A lot of people from West Africa, like Sierra Leone, uh, Nigeria, and I, <coughs> I became friends with uh, some Sierra Leone brothers, and they were Muslim, Muslim by name, you know, they, 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 you know, some of their family were Muslim, but they didn't really know much about Islam. But anyway, we, we began to do business, and eventually uh, I had to travel to Africa. Uh, to Sierra Leone, we were selling cars and I was also getting involved in studying diamonds and, and learning about diamonds. So this is like the, the path which I, I wanted to take, you know, because this is what my friends were doing. And it was good money, you know, we, we were just, you know, living the life, you know, trying to make as much money as we can, enjoying life, spending it, wasting it all away. You know, this is what we was doing. And my... My experience in Africa, the first country I went to was actually Senegal in Dakar, uh, Dakar in Senegal, and it's 90, over 90% 90 Muslim, yeah, and this was the first time I actually heard the call to prayer, the Adhan, you know, uh, calling the Muslims to come and pray, you know.
you know, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You know, and this this sound of the the actual adhan, you know, it really made me think, what is this? Yeah. And and um, it made me want to know more about Islam. You know, and at the time I was actually stuck because I was only supposed to be in Senegal for maybe two or three days, and I told the hotel manager, you know, because I was actually stranded there for over two weeks and I didn't have any money to pay for the hotel. I told the hotel manager and he said, no problem, come to my house. So the hotel manager took me to his house and he was a Muslim. I was a bit scared to go to his house at first because, you know, I just thought Muslims are all terrorists and all the things I'd heard were all bad things. But I had no option. You know, I couldn't phone home because my parents didn't even know I was in Africa. Yeah, so, you know, I had, I had to go to his house. I went to his house. And this is where I heard the Adhan. And while I was there, his grandmother died. His grandmother passed away and she was over 100 years old. And he was crying on the bed. And I remember putting my arm around him and saying, look, you know, she'll go to a better place. You know, just trying to comfort him. And he said, I'm not crying because she died. He said, I'm crying because I wanted, her, I wanted you to meet her because I wanted her to make dua for you, that you would be a Muslim. He said, because she's an old woman. And Allah will answer her du'as. And this really touched me because I thought the guy is not even upset because she died. Yeah, he, he's, he's, he's in full belief that she's going somewhere better, which I wasn't, you know, trying to comfort him. You know, and it made me want to know more about Islam. You know, so a lot of misconceptions were cleared up there. So this was at, like the beginning of me looking into Islam, uh, you know, to start to look just, just for interest, just because I wanted to know what these Muslims believe because they're nice people. So over the years, I actually moved on to Sierra Leone. We was getting involved in business and things like this. And it was actually um, like for many years, like my friends, they would go to certain people in Sierra Leone who was dealing with witchcraft. They was dealing, you know, they have different names for it, like juju or voodoo. You know, they'd be involved in these rituals where they would be contacting the unseen world, like the jinn for help. You know, so they ask the jinn to go and do some things for them, you know, whether it's in business or whatever they're doing for protection, you know, and he was getting involved in this. And this became very real to me, you know, you know, I believed that the world of the jinn existed, you know, because the things I witnessed in Africa and even in London, and um, when I was staying with my friends in like South London, like, you know, this is happening, that I believed in it, you know. And when I came back to England, I told my Libyan friend, I told him what I'd witnessed in, in Africa about all this juju and these, you know, these supernatural things happening. And he said, yeah, in Islam we believe in this, but this is illegal. You know, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to communicate with these, these things. It's illegal in Islam. And he showed me a lecture um, by Dr. Bilal Phillips, which explained the world of the jinn. And this actually was the beginning of me actually maybe believing mm -hmm that the Qur'an might be from that God which I believe in. Yeah, because I've always believed in the one God. But from this point, this was when I was actually questioning maybe the Qur'an is from that God, from the God that I believe in. So I started to look more into the Qur'an. And finally I began to believe in it, you know, start to believe in Islam, start to look into it. And, and I started to pray in my own way. You know, I, start, I fasted the month of Ramadan in my... My, my, my bedroom at home, yeah, and it wasn't until about six months to a year later I went to Egypt, Cairo, uh, I went to see a friend of mine in Cairo, and I went to the first mosque, because I'd never been in a mosque before, because I was quite scared of going in the mosques, you know, again I had a lot of misconceptions of being all this, I was scared to go in the mosque, and I went to the mosque, and I asked my friend, I said, can you teach me how to pray properly? And he said, no. He said, because you're not a Muslim. I said, I am a Muslim. I pray, I fast, you know, I try. He said, no, you have to say the Shahada. You know, and I didn't know what the Shahada was. You know, I said, what's the Shahada? He said, this is a declaration of faith, you know, to declare that there's nothing worthy of worship mm -hmm. except Allah and Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger. So this is when I actually embraced Islam, you know, officially. Um, I was back in... 2006 Okay, mashallah um, Aki, can you now tell us um, how coming to Islam has changed your life? Since accepting Islam, you know, I, it wasn't easy, you know, because I was, a, I was still a singer I was still doing, you know, things that 
not good, you know, the undesirable things like, you know. And it's not easy just to give all that up straight away. I mean, many people, that's it, you know, they just give it up and it's, it's out of their life. But for me, I couldn't do it. You know, I wasn't strong enough. My belief wasn't enough just to leave that life straight away. It took a long time for me to, you know, give up my singing. The singing was the hardest thing, you know, in the music. Um, because it was a big love of my life. Um, but eventually, you know, I just stopped singing certain songs, stopped listening to certain music. Um, and eventually, I just found that the circles, the brothers who I was with, the friends I was keeping, you know, eventually I just gave these things up. You know, it wasn't so difficult. Um, a big point, a turning point in my life was that during this period of me actually when I was, you know, beginning to pray and, be and I actually accepted Islam, it, over this period of time where I was actually transitioning from a non-Muslim, you know, from a Jahiliya actually to accepting Islam, I had a court case going on, you know, for over two years. It was a very stressful time for me and my family, you know, and, um, but alhamdulillah, you know, I was accused of something and, and they all went away, you know, the, the day uh, the court case was about to take place, you know, it all got cancelled, you know, and I always remember, like, I was coming down the, the court stairs and my dad said, that was the jinn that protected you. Yeah, and my dad's a non-Muslim, and he was actually on this belief, you know, for such a long time because he knew about the world of the jinn and he knew about some of these things. And I said, no, it was Allah. I said, it was, it was Allah, it was God what protected me. Because at this point, you know, I had actually left uh, these circles which I was involved in where you're getting caught up in the wrong things, you know, getting accused of the wrong things, you know. And that's what happens ultimately, whether you're innocent or not. You know, if you've get the, if you if you've got the wrong company, you're gonna get dragged into these things. You know, so this is the importance of Islam, where you know you are who your friends are. You know, so for me, you know, over this transition period, I just backed off from certain friends. You know, and started to spend more time in the mosque. You know, the, uh, especially like Ramadan. You know, we had Ramadan. You know, spending time with the brothers, spending a lot of time just learning. You know, YouTube helps, you know, there's a lot of lectures and things on there. But it's, it's about just taking time away. You know, you have to distance yourself from certain people and actually move on with your life. You know, but it takes time. It, it wasn't easy uh, when I first became a Muslim. You know, my parents, they didn't like it. They were worried. You know, they just thought I was becoming a terrorist. Um, but now they, they acknowledge that I've become a better person. You know, they've been, I've, I've seen them ask been asked many times about me and he said that I'm definitely a better person now than I was um, you know I'm hoping that I'm a better son and a brother than I was before um, but it, I mean I've been become more involved in the community by you know telling people about Islam uh, actively involved in Dawah telling people about Islam doing talks uh, in the universities and different things like this and I've also since gone back to Africa yeah, because Africa, you know, I have a big love for Africa because it's where I first heard the Adan, it's where I first, you know, started to understand the world, the unseen world, and it's also where I took my Shahada in Egypt, you see. So I decided that I'm going to go back to Africa, and a few years ago I set up my own charity called Volunteers Sierra Leone, uh, where we're actually now responsible for 65 Muslim schools around Sierra Leone, you know, so now this is actually we're in the process of preparing volunteers to actually go back to Africa and actually help uh, the Muslims and the non-Muslims uh, with education. Because education is the key. You know, if you, if you look at the, the, brother, well, the, the people what was living in my parents' area, you know, the, what I was telling you about before, you know, with this, where the education is bad, you know, these people, none of them have been to college even, none of them have been to university. They've all, you know, a lot of them have no jobs. You know, they don't know much about life, you know, but because my parents sent me to a, quite a good school on the other side of the city, you know, I got to experience different cultures and understand education is the key. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's about giving back to the community, giving back to, uh, you know, Africa, especially for me. What advice have you got to Muslims and non-Muslims 
regarding Islam. The advice that I would give to non-Muslims is just open your heart and sincerely look into the religion of Islam. Yeah, you know, read the Quran with an open heart and just see what you think. You know, and if if you do believe in a one true God, put your head on the floor when you're alone. And ask that God, ask the Creator to guide you to the straight way. Put your head on the floor, submit to God and ask Him, if Islam is true, show me. And, and this is the advice I give to non-Muslims. For the Muslims, the advice would be that I advise the Muslims to actually study and learn more about Islam. But whatever you do know, you have to pass on. Yeah. If you know non-Muslims, if you know Muslims that are not practicing, you have to advise them to actually come back to Islam. And the other advice is to keep with keep up with your salah. This this is very important. If you've got the salah, everything else will come, inshallah. Okay. I'd just like to say Jazakallah khair. Thank you for Roadside to Islam for inviting me on the show. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.